Well, um, welcome everyone to our first official seminar. This gives me great pleasure to introduce Hillary Martins. Great, thank you so much, Mark, and thank you all for being here. Okay, well, yeah, it's it's a privilege to get to have the opportunity to share a bit about my work, but also uh, more broadly, uh, many different teams of people that have been involved in this work. Um, so I actually have a big list here uh, in acknowledgments of people I've highlighted, folks from UM, past and present, in no particular order here, but um, just to, to demonstrate um, how many people are involved in this work. And I was hoping to have some undergraduates here today and just make the note that one of the super cool things about science is getting to work with big teams of people and collaborate and bounce ideas off each other and share our expertise and share our unique perspectives. Um, and that's something that's just, it's one of the coolest things about science. So I hope that for those of you who are, have yet to become involved in research, I hope you do and, and you can look forward to that uh, being part of the excitement of working towards a common goal. Uh, this work that I'll present today is funded by a number of different agencies, including the National Science Foundation, NASA, and the Swiss National Science Foundation. We're grateful to our funding agencies and their support of this work. Okay, well, we'll begin with some motivation here. So many of us are probably familiar with the current drought conditions that are plaguing the Western US. Um, reservoirs such as Lake Oroville in California, which is shown here, are at or near all-time historic lows. Okay? Um, under normal conditions, the water level should be up here at the tree line. That's obviously not the case right now. Um, so now the more accurately that we can assess water levels on land and in the ground over time, the better job that we can do at managing our valuable freshwater resources. Okay, and here's a map from the US Drought Monitor that's showing drought intensity throughout the Western US. This uh, map here is current of last week in July of this year, 2021. Um, the, darker, the darker red colors here are showing uh, more intense region that are experiencing more intense drought. Um, and there are a number of different sort of indicators that go into classifying drought in this case, including temperature, precipitation, soil moisture content, stream flow. There are a number of different factors that sort of get combined into this kind of broad scale regional estimate of drought. I've highlighted in the box here at the upper right, um, this is drought intensity as a percentage of land area in the Western US. And you can see that at least as of the end of July of this year, so this summer, about a quarter of the Western US was experiencing exceptional drought conditions, which is the highest category of drought. And then almost two thirds of the Western US was experiencing either extreme or exceptional drought. Okay, so what effect does a sustained prolonged period of drought have on the solid earth, right? The solid earth actually responds to that removal of mass. So we're, we're losing mass due to the drought, this mass of water due to the drought. And because of that, we're reducing pressure, the, this normal force, this pressure that's applied to the surface of the earth due to the weight of that water, we're reducing that pressure by moving away the mass. And that allows the surface to rise upward. So the earth is not perfectly rigid. Whenever we have a movement of mass, we also have earth deformation. So this figure here is showing that from a period of drought that we had from about 2011 to 2014. So each one of the panels here is showing um, vertical displacement of the ground each uh, year in this sequence here. So we're seeing, well, each one of these squares is the location of a GPS station. Um, and so we have more than a thousand of these stations in the Western US. And over time, the colors are becoming redder. And this indicates to us that the surface is lifting upward. And we can take this estimate of surface uplift 
Combine that with some knowledge of the interior structure of the earth, so the mechanical properties, the density of the interior of the earth, um, and turn that into an estimate of how much water must have been lost from the Western US during this period of time in order to explain that surface uplift, to explain those observations, right? So just in the year from 2013 to 2014, that one year, we estimate, or it is estimated, that about 63 trillion gallons of water was lost from the Western US during that time period. And that's approximately equivalent to the annual mass loss from the Greenland ice sheet. Um, this, again, I'm yeah, I know, can people hear me still, it's okay? <laughs> Yeah, so just in the one year period from 2013 to 2014, taking that amount of ground uplift combined with current structure, uh, we estimate that, or it's estimated that 63 trillion gallons of water is lost, which is approximately equivalent to the annual mass loss from the green Um, By the way, this figure here, um, it's actually adapted from a figure that was published in Science by Adrian Borsa and colleagues back in 2014. But this particular, so the adaptation was intended for broad audiences and this particular one was published in the LA Times. Okay, so let's back up for a moment here and talk about the scientific foundation for what we're talking about here, the, the physics of this. And we're talking about a phenomenon called surface loading. And this is the process by which the earth deforms under the weight of its envelopes, so the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. And by the way, actually, it's not just fluids, but also any redistribution of mass. So it could be landslides or, um, but fluids are dominating this signal. And they come in many different forms. So we have loading from the oceans, we have loading from the atmosphere, we have loading from continental water, so rivers and snow and groundwater and soil moisture and, <laughs> Um, or mass loss from wildfire, anything, anything where you have a redistribution of mass. Okay? And that pressure from the mass that we place somewhere that pushes down on the surface of the earth and the earth deforms under that weight. So that's what we're seeing in the curve here. We can see that here in the curve, that's the solid earth's response to the weight of a fluid or the weight of some kind of mass. Um, this, this curve here, I've removed the numbers for simplicity, but this is actually, the, the results here are an actual model for Earth's response to surface loading that's been computed with the load def software. And uh, this software is open source. It's freely available on GitHub. So I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. I know some of you are already working with it. Um, and then feedback and questions are always welcome. So, okay. So that's how we sort of a glimpse into how we model things, but we can also measure this deformation of the Earth. And we do this with space geodesy. That could be INSAR, space based gravity measurements. The one that I'm illustrating here is Global Navigation Satellite Systems, or GNSS. And this is an umbrella term for all satellite navigation and positioning systems including GPS, which is the global positioning system. So GPS sort of falls under the umbrella of GNSS, right? Um, so I'm just showing kind of a little schematic diagram of a, a GNSS ground antenna that's anchored into the ground. When we have a fluid uh, where there's an increase in pressure, so we're depositing mass in a region, maybe from a large snowstorm or a flood, for example, um, that extra mass depresses the surface downward. And in response to that, our GNSS station moves downward and toward the load. We're moving toward the load when we're putting a load in place. On the other hand, <clears throat> when we have an unloading of fluid, so this might be during our sustained periods of high temperature that cause water to evaporate and maybe water has run off the land surface, and so an evacuation of fluid. Then the opposite happens. We have an uplift of the ground surface. We measure this uplift, and our GNSS station moves away from that region of unloading. 
Okay, and so here I've added the numbers <laughs> for these models. Um, I had to make some assumptions here about what are the mechanical and density properties of the earth. And I've assumed for those of you who know about seismology or earth models, I've assumed PREM structure. The top panel is showing lateral displacement and the bottom is showing vertical displacement. And then all the colors are showing disks of various radii here, starting from one kilometer up to 200 kilometers. And what I've done for these models is just apply one meter of fresh water uniformly throughout the disk. So we can just get a sense for, okay, if we increase the sort of spatial wavelength of the load, how does that affect the displacement? What kind of magnitude of displacement can we expect for a load of various size? Obviously, the bigger the disk, the more the displacement. So for a 200 kilometer disk, we have almost two centimeters of vertical displacement at the center of where that load is. And then less than a millimeter when we have the smallest disks. Um, the lateral displacement always peaks right at the edge of the load. So we have maximum horizontal displacement right at the edge of the load. It goes to zero at the center. It goes to zero in the far field. Okay. So in, in real data, it's not as nice and neat and clean as these disks of various size, right? We have very complicated fluid loads in nature. We have the oceans, we have the atmosphere, we have all kinds of different sources of water over the continent. So how does that manifest in actual data, right? So here we have um, a GPS time series uh, for a, a station in Brazil. The blue dots are showing the actual GPS data at five minute temporal resolution. So very high rate. Um, and the black line that's overlaid is showing a model fit to that data based on knowledge of the periods of ocean tides. Okay, so the black line is showing a tidal fit. Um, we're looking at a period of eight days here, just, just about one week of data. Okay, vertical peak to peak amplitude is about 12 centimeters. Um, so yeah, you can see that the oscillations here are about every half day, but then there's some longer period oscillations on, at periods of one day and even longer period than that. So that's a tidal signal. And then we also have atmospheric pressure. Okay, so we're familiar with high and low uh, pressure weather systems that come through an area, right? We hear that on the news. We hear a high pressure weather system is coming through town or a low pressure weather system this weekend. Um, so we actually can measure that in GPS data in terms of this ground deformation. We can actually sense different weather systems coming through. So the blue dots here are again GPS data from the state of Alaska here at daily resolution. And the black line is a a model for you take um, weather models, numerical weather models, and predict what we expect the ground to do under that pressure. So the black line is a model. Um, you can see that it explains a lot of the scatter in our GPS time. This particular one now we're, we're zooming out. This is a period of eight months. And the peak to peak amplitude here is about four centimeters. Okay, and then we have hydrologic loading. So I consider this anything that's non-oceanic. So basically continental water loading. This can be snow in the mountains, groundwater, soil moisture, surface water, rivers, lakes, things like that. Um, now we're zooming out even further. This is a period of eight years and the peak to peak amplitude for the whole thing here is about four centimeters, although this oscillation is only about two centimeters. Um, so we can see this, this annual oscillation in here. This is a station in Alaska, um, and this is predominantly due to snow loading and unloading that's seasonal. Okay, so 
Now we come to our first sort of big picture motivation here, which is to track and quantify freshwater resources using space geodesy. So traditionally, we have estimated water storage uh, using hydrological methods um, and can use a water balance model to do this, whereby we can estimate water that's lost from a watershed uh, by these evapotranspiration and discharge terms, and we are subtracting those from water that's gained from precipitation. So then we can get an estimate of changes in water storage. But this sort of emerging technique now of hydrogeodesy allows us also to place constraints on this delta S term, but in a different way. So what we are doing is we're monitoring changes in the shape of the earth with high precision that have to do with the redistribution of water mass. So we're measuring how the earth is changing in shape over time. I know it's weird to think about the earth changing in shape. Right? We're, changing, we're measuring how the earth is changing shape over time. That's related in part to the redistribution of water mass. And then we can turn that into an estimate of how much water was gained or lost, given that we know something about how the earth is producing. So this gives us an independent estimate then of delta S. Um, which can be really helpful then for hydrologic modeling, especially because some of these terms have somewhat large uncertainties. Okay, so let's return now to our discussion of drought from earlier. So one thing we can do here with geodesy is explore water storage changes on the inner annual scale. So not just those seasonal oscillations, but looking over longer periods of time how much water is systematically lost from, for example, the whole Western US or California during several years of sustained drought conditions. Okay, so on the left here, we're looking at ground uplift measured by GNSS during a period of harsh drought from October 2011 to October 2015. So the color scale here is showing vertical land displacement up to about two centimeters even a little bit more than two centimeters in some parts of California. And we can turn those, uh, those measurements of ground uplift into an estimate of how much water had to have been lost in order to explain the surface uplift. And so doing that, um, we estimate that about up to about a meter of water was lost from parts of California, including the Sierra Nevada, during this period of harsh drought that ended in 2015. Okay, and this was the situation at the end of that particular period of drought. So this is from 2015 here. And just for comparison, that's where we were in 2015. Here's where we are now. So I'll just flip back. So parts of California were in that really exceptional drought intense drought back then as well, but now we have even wider swaths of the US that are also experiencing exceptional or extreme drought. Okay, so where, where are we at right now? Um, and what is the current situation looking like? This is specific to California here. So we have water that is lost or gained in California, both past and present. This is showing uh, GPS, uh, inferences of water storage. Um, and also uh, there's a, a signal for GRACE here, which is a, another geodetic experiment, also space-based satellite um, that's measuring Earth's gravity field and changes in Earth's gravity field through time. So GRACE is also sensitive to the redistribution of mass in the Earth system. Okay, and these, these lines have just been staggered here for, for clarity of visualization. So we think of them in sort of a relative sense rather than this kind of offset here. Okay, so first of all, uh, this is what we had looked at a couple slides before, this period from 2011 to 2015 of harsh drought, where there's this systematic sort of decline. Uh, overall, we still have these seasonal fluctuations, but superimposed on that is this decline in water volume, water storage over that time period. So this was harsh drought 
that ended around 2015. We then had a few years where that trend reversed and we actually had a few years of heavy precipitation. And then now, oops, now we're descending back again. We're, we're in the midst of another period of pressure. We're trending downward again in terms of change in water volume. And uh, we still have some more data to fill in here for the latter part of 2021. But we're expecting that the total water in the ground is going to be at an all time low for these particular regions of California. Okay, I just want to touch briefly on an exciting project that many of you know of because many of you are working on it. Um, but that we have going on in this department right now, interdisciplinary, um, and we are also working forestry with other institutions. So it's very exciting. I just want to give you a brief kind of overview of it. And what we're trying to do is push the limits on hydrogeodetic resolution, both spatially and temporally. Um, we're investigating watershed storage and taking that a step further to also investigate watershed dynamics, specifically at the scale of mountain watersheds. We have a few target watersheds. One of them is right out our back door here in, uh, well, down the Bitterroot, in the Sully Locksaw watershed, um, which is sort of right on the Montana Idaho border. And then we have three target watersheds in California as well. Um, Okay, so what we want to do in this project is advance both the modeling and then the forecasting of water storage and stream flow by coupling geodesy with hydrology. So we're working at the intersection here between these two disciplines. This team is composed of geodesists, hydrologists, meteorologists. It's really exciting to work at the boundaries of those disciplines and try to figure out ways that by combining them, how we can push the science forward. So um, four of our main objectives here are to improve observational data sets specifically for water storage monitoring. So traditionally, G GNSS has been used mostly for tectonic modeling or uh, measuring tectonic processes, monitoring tectonic. Um, so this is sort of a new emerging field uh, to use geodesy for hydrologic monitoring. Um, and our team is really well poised to make some important advances in that area. So, okay, second, uh, explore empirical relationships that combine geodesy and hydrology. Third is to enhance numerical tools to model surface loading. So, for example, Matthew is taking part of that on, and we're doing some cool things looking at okay, what is the what are the limits of resolution that we can do for, for hydrologic monitoring. And then finally, to pilot operational products for water resource management. So we don't, you know, advancing the science is great, but we want it to be useful beyond that as well. So we are already working with water management agencies in California um, to try to figure out where we can go with this and what might be most useful for, um, on the operational side of things, okay. So to the first point, our field teams have been very active. Um, some of our field crew, uh, we had them out in the field this weekend um, and for the past couple of years. So here, uh, just a, a few photos. Um, all of these, I believe, except maybe this one in the upper left are from the Idaho Montana field sites in the Selway Waxwell watershed. Um, so you probably recognize some familiar faces here. We also, super cool, we have undergrads involved in this work as well. So we have lots of grad students involved. We also have undergraduates that get involved too. Um, and this is just a brief note here on, on one thing we're working on in terms of developing empirical relationships and um, is seeing what we can learn from geodesy about constraining, um, input precipitation at the storm scale. So we are partnering here with the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, which is out of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And this movie here is showing what's called an atmospheric river, which is a very uh, sort of concentrated narrow channel of water vapor 
in the atmosphere. It actually looks like a river, which is why it's called an atmospheric river. But this basically channel a bunch of water vapor into the Western US. And that's where we get most of the precipitation that comes to the Western US. Um, so this is just one very large atmospheric river event from January of 2017, where, um, the, uh, where California actually received a, a lot of um, input precipitation during that event. Okay, and here's an example of, so this is still a work in progress, but I thought I'd share it anyway. Um, water storage changes at the storm scale. So we're looking at a vertical component GPS time series here. This is a station um, that's located in the Yuba Feather watershed, which is sort of the northern part of the Sierra Nevada. And there were three large atmospheric river events that came through this area at the start of 2017. One of them we had seen in the movie in the previous slide. So what we expect when we get these large storms coming through is that there's a lot of input mass, water mass. And so we expect to have subsidence of the ground um, under the weight of that mass if the earth is responding elastically. Um, if we're above an aquifer, we can get a porous response, uh, sort of the opposite behavior. But in general, especially in the mountainous regions, we expect this elastic subsidence response. Um, and that's what we see here. So when the red line is showing cumulative precipitation from the start of the water year, and so where we have these steep slopes uh, here, that's indicating that um, there's a, 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 lot, a large storm. So there's a lot of precipitation that's being dumped at that time. And then in the GPS, uh, we see a downward displacement, which uh, is what would be expected when there's uh, a lot of mass uh, that's being deposited there. Okay. So uh, next, next big picture motivation. Something that I think a lot about um, is how we can improve our GNSS processing and corrections to GNSS time series so that we can enhance time series precision. Um, this is one thing, <laughs> it's maybe not the most fun thing to think about um, because it's more in the nitty gritty of, before we get to the fun analysis. Um, but there's actually a lot that goes in to turning a satellite signal, right? So our antennas are, are detecting these signals from satellites. We have to turn that into an estimate of site position over time. There's a lot that goes into turning those satellite signals into an estimate of site position. Um, so when we compare different, so there are a number of different processing centers that produce daily GNSS products. When you start to compare them, you notice really significant differences between them. Um, and we did a study a couple of years ago looking at just those seasonal oscillations which are largely due to the redistribution of water mass, right? So we might use that as an estimate of how much the, the sort of water load is changing over time and use that to inform water management decisions potentially. But comparing different data products, um, they can be give discrepant results by up to a factor of 1.5 or more. Um, so it's just something to be aware of that um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of decisions that have to be made in terms of how to parameterize the solution for um, position. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to go too much into this, but, but one of those decisions that has to be made is how to account for signal propagation delays through the troposphere. So the satellite signals are not tr uh, being transmitted through a vacuum. They're being transmitted through the atmosphere, which uh, is dense uh, and sometimes has more water vapor content in a particular area than other times. So that's not a trivial thing to sort of account for, but it has a direct impact on your position estimate. So there are different methods that processing centers use to account for that troposphere delay. Um, and that can, okay, so that affects the position estimates. Um, and then if you remember back to the start of the talk and I was saying 
Okay, we have this atmosphere pressure loading signal when high and low pressure weather systems come through an area. Uh, and so um, I'll just point out a couple of those here. So for example, we have a high pressure system here that pushes the ground down. When we have a low pressure system, the ground can rebound back upward. Okay. Um, so we probably generally want to correct for that because the scale of displacement is actually on par with our hydrological signals. <laughs> They're at the same level in terms of how big those signals are. Um, but for, depending on how the data are processed, uh, removing this signal can actually do more harm than good because some processing techniques uh, unintentionally absorb part of this signal. Um, so I guess the point I want to make here is just to, to sort of be cautious and, and be informed about the way that the data are processed um, because it can actually make a difference in how we interpret the hydrologic signals and other signals, tectonic deformation, volcanic deformation, and so on. Okay. So finally, the last thing that I want to mention here, uh, last big picture motivation is that we can turn this whole problem on its side and do it the opposite way around. So I've been talking about using GNSS displacement to infer the distribution of water on the surface of the Earth, or the distribution of some load on the surface of the Earth. But we can turn that around and look at it the other way too, um, in that we're using GNSS displace uh, measurements of displacements due to loading and think about okay what can this tell us about earth structure what can this tell us about essentially the squishiness of the earth so how does the earth respond to a given force if we know that force really well which we actually do in the case of the ocean tides if we know that force really well then when we're trying to fine tune our model to match the observations, what we want to fine tune in this case is the structure of the Earth. So, okay. So this is a movie of one component of the total tide, uh, which is a rather large component. Um, this is known as the M2 tide. It's the principal lunar semi-diurnal tide. So it has a period of 12.42 hours. Oh, now you can't see it, but you can see time ticking away at the top. Once it gets to 12.42 hours, the whole thing repeats. So this is a periodic signal here. Red is denoting a period of high tide and blue is low tide. So the color bar in the bottom right is showing the tide height. This is basically a perturbation to sea level by up to a meter up, a meter down for low tide. The scale is saturated. So in a few places, it's even more significant than that. And then in this movie, I've superimposed on here the response of the continents to the loading by the tides offshore. So the color bar on the left is showing what is the ground deformation response or the, the displacement um, of the continents that's happening in response to the tides offshore, this redistribution of mass in the oceans. Okay, and this scale is also saturated. Um, so for example, if you're sitting on the coast of Brazil here, like to use this as an analogy, um, and you're sipping your favorite beverage, you're enjoying your time at the beach, right? Um, that every 12 hours, you're actually moving up by four centimeters, down by eight centimeters, and back up by four centimeters. So the displacement amplitude here is about four centimeters. Now we don't really notice this happening in practice because everyone and everything around us is moving in the same way. This is a very long wavelength signal. When I say wavelength, I mean the spatial extent of it. Um, so, but that is actually happening every 12 hours that you're moving in that way because of the weight of the water offshore. Okay, so, so far I've just showed you this, this M2 tide, um, but there are other tidal harmonics as well that make uh, relatively large contributions to the total tide. So O1 is a diurnal tide, a lunar tide with an amplitude uh, of about 20 centimeters at maximum. 
And then MF is a lunar fortnightly tide. So this has a period of about two weeks. And this is just a tiny one. So the sea surface height is only being perturbed up to about three centimeters right? over a course of two weeks. But I'm going to show you how cool this is that we are actually at the threshold of being able to measure the solid Earth's response even to this little tiny MF tide. It's pretty remarkable, actually. Okay, so um, our, these are our observations of this oceanic tidal loading. This is a study that we did in Alaska. Um, so all the dots up here are showing stations that we used in our analysis. Um, some are different colored for various reasons some influence of volcanic deformation, some tectonic transients, and so on. Um, but we used all these stations in our analysis. And the bottom panel is showing just one station, this red station here, uh, and our, the GPS data, and then our tidal fit to that data. So we actually used more than five years of data, more than five years, and then we did a harmonic analysis to that entire time span of data. This is just a one week snapshot in the middle of that five year period. And so I hope you can see how, how good <laughs> the fit looks here, given that this is a one week snapshot within a five year period of time. Um, we're looking at the east component, north component, and up component of displacement. The red line is the model, the blue dots are the GPS data, and then the bottom panel in each pair is showing the residual. And the histograms on the right are also showing those residuals for that entire five years plus of data. Okay, and here are the results. So each one of these ellipses is at the location of a GPS station. And the color is showing the vertical response to that tide, in this case, M2. And uh, the size and the shape and the orientation of the ellipse is showing the horizontal motion. So that, those were our observations. Now we also need to predict what we expect to see in terms of that ocean oceanic response. So this is how we do that. Um, basically what we want to know is what is the displacement at a particular location due to a given load, right? That's what we want to know. So this is our displacement term, uh, the response at a particular observation point. And then we have this right-hand side in the green box here, this is our, what's called a load greens function. And this is the really critical term because this contains all the relevant physics of the problem. G, our greens function is what allows us to map the force to the response. It, it of course contains information about Earth's structure here because this is telling us, okay, for a given model for Earth structure or planetary structure or whatever, structure you want it's not specific to the earth right if we press on it with a given force how does it respond that's what it's telling us so there's a lot of physics that goes into that g term a lot uh, but that's the really cr critical term okay that that allows us to to map a force to the displacement on the far right hand side here we have everything to do with the load so we have the density of the load, we have the height of the load, and then we're integrating this uh, function here over the entire surface of the Earth. So wherever we have load, we're going to integrate over the entire distribution of that load. And uh, computing that integral, then uh, we end up with the displacement at a single point, which is our observation point, so particular GNSS station. So if we break this down even further, we have a displacement that's equal to a displacement per unit force times a force. Yeah. So there's that mapping term here. It tells us for a particular force, what is the displacement? Okay, and this formula here is not specific to the load tides, but we can do the spreading load. So we use the same procedure for snow loading, for soil moisture loading, for river loading, for atmosphere pressure loading. It's all the same physics. Um, and then again, the software that we used to do this, because this software is special in that it uh, has the physics needed to compute this G term. Um, so that's load def, uh, again, shameless plug available on GitHub. 
let me know if you have questions. Okay, so here we have our observations side by side with our predictions. So uh, the predictions are computed using the equation that we just saw. The observations, of course, are from the GNSS data and the harmonic analysis. Um, so just visually looking at this, yeah, we can see some small differences, but overall it's clear that, that the GNSS are detecting this signal and our forward models are pretty accurately representing this signal as well. Um, here are some of the residuals. Uh, and on the left-hand side here, we are looking at residuals between observations and predictions for a particular, um, uh, I can't see it here, but uh, Earth model, litho 1.0, and here's a different Earth model here. Uh, there are some differences here when we swap in a different Earth structure. So there is sensitivity to Earth structure. On the right-hand side, it's the same thing, but we've removed a network uniform signal, which we call the harmonic common mode. Um, and I won't go to, into that in detail, but it's basically, it's the, the whole network responding in the same way. So long wavelength errors, like inconsistencies in reference frame and stuff like that, that we don't care about as much as deficiencies in our forward model at this regional scale. Okay. Uh, so we've also looked at the effect of anelastic dispersion in the asthenosphere. This is one thing that's really cool about tides because most of our knowledge about Earth's interior structure comes from seismology, where we have really high frequency waves that are sampling Earth's structure at like one second periods, okay? But the tides are operating at periods of 12 hours or a day or two weeks. So by using road tides, we actually have the opportunity to investigate the mechanical response of the mantle at these periods that are intermediary between seismic and glacial periods. Okay. So we've actually been adjusting our earth structure to account for dispersion at tidal periods within the asthenosphere. And that can actually, so that's the red curve here. The closer the red curve is to the left side, the better, because that means the residuals are lower. So accounting for anelastic dispersion actually does reduce the residuals, um, at least in the horizontal components and somewhat in the vertical as well. So this is something that, that we're exploring. Okay, and then as promised, here's the O1 tide and here's that little tiny MF tide. That was just the three centimeter amplitude one comparing the observations with the predictions. Not perfect, but I think you, you can see that there are some similarities. Um, we're really right at the threshold right now of being able to detect um, this little tiny two week period tide, which is important for evaluating mantle response. Um, and so hopefully, I mean, yeah, there's, there's consistency there. And certainly for the O1 tide, this has a period of about a day. Okay, um, I know we're running short on time here, but I did wanna share a project that I've been working on now for about four years. This is a collaboration I have with um, colleagues in Switzerland at ETH Zurich. And we are working to sort of advance the technologies needed to model the load tides, specifically on a 3D Earth. So the modeling that load def does is already on a 3D Earth, but it, it's spherically symmetric. So it doesn't incorporate lateral variations in structure. It can't uh, deal with topography or ellipticity. So we have to take a totally different approach to be able to do that. Uh, it requires fully numerical modeling um, based on here, we're doing that based on spectral element methods. Um, and what we want to do here, what we're working towards is investigating sensitivity to lateral contrast in elasticity and density structure inside the Earth. Uh, what are the effects of topography on Earth's response to loading, which can actually be potentially really critical for our analyses of water loading in mountain watersheds. What is the effect of topography and then ellipticity? 
So here is uh, our mesh for the year. And for ocean tidal loading in this case, you can see the, the tidal signals on the side here. Um, the thing I want to point out here is the mesh uh, is actually extended beyond the surface of the Earth. So this corresponds with distance away from the surface of the Earth. But what this does is allows us to incorporate the physics of gravity into the problem. Uh, so that's, that's one big technological leap that has to be made here to incorporate the physics of gravity. And then here's what our uh, mesh looks like on the surface of the Earth, where we have to have really fine uh, elements, uh, high refinement along the coastlines to capture the spatial complexities of the load itself. Okay, and we've been doing some model verification here. This is one test that we've done where you can see how the new software Selvis and Load Def compare. So this is a summary. Um, precise geodetic measurements and models of Earth's response to surface loading can, first of all, provide insight into Earth's interior structure. Um, there are lots of interesting questions that we can explore here, like the structure and long-term stability of cratons, mantle dynamics, and so on. Um, track surface fluid storage and redistribution. This is important for water resource management, for climate science, um, for uh, water cycle science. Um, and then also, I didn't talk about this much, but the importance of enhancing time series precision and the corrections that we make to time series, this is critical to get accurate interpretations of um, some of these processes that we are investigating. So this might be for aseismic slip events at subduction zones, volcanic inflation, and also, I should say here, the hydrologic loading that we're working so hard on. Um, so I think I will end there and just put up this slide because we have done a huge amount of work also on the UM Seismic Network. This is a network that I sort of refounded when I started here. Um, there used to be a network back in the 1970s that went away. And we've been doing a lot of work to bring that back. A lot of students have been involved with this project over the years. And there's some cool results I was hoping to present, but there's not enough time to do that. But um, thank you very much for being here. And I'm ha I know I only have a few minutes, but I'm happy to take questions. Hey, uh, some questions for Hillary? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Noah. There we are. Yeah, I can answer Noah's first. Um, okay, can deformation at oceanic or can it be measured at oceanic depths? If not, could deformation at oceanic depths be inferred from tides? Um, yeah, so we can certainly uh, certainly model this. Um, in fact, I showed that movie of how the continents deform under the weight of the ocean tides. I didn't show the deformation in the ocean basins just so I could show the tides offshore. But yeah, and that's where actually the biggest displacement signals are seen because they're right where the load is happening. It's trickier to, to make any measurements from the seafloor. Um, sometimes we'll have an isolated station on a very small like Pacific Island or something, which gives us a good estimate of what the um, observed deformation signal might be throughout the ocean basins. But yeah, great question, Noah. Yeah. Can you apply that a polar model for the structure? Which would be more confounding. Um, what are you using to get that information? Yeah, so we do a sort of multipole expansion of the gravity field out to a pretty far distance away, and then we do apply a Neumann boundary condition at the edge. Um, and at first, we were extending the mesh way out and then doing a Dirichlet boundary condition and just setting um, the gravitational field uh, to zero really far out, be like 50 times past the orbital radius of the moon. Um, but yeah, the more sophisticated way is to actually do this expansion of Poisson's equation and, and use the Neumann boundary condition at the edge. Yeah. The subsurface heterogeneity. Yeah. Yeah. So that 
exactly what we're trying to get at with this SWIFT project. Um, it's been a huge project. I mean, this is not simple to make the leap in advancing this type of technology, but that's exactly one of the things we want to get at um, and test is what is the sensitivity to these lateral variations and um, the elastic moduli density and Geneva structure. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> question. Yeah, I mean, if we treat it like that, then we only get an estimate of displacement that's from exactly what we're saying uh, was removed in terms of mass or put into the system in terms of mass. So then we're not getting a sense for contributions to displacement from outside. So usually we do make corrections for like from uh, satellite gravity, uh, what is the forward field displacement, make corrections to yes that way. Um, but yeah, an absolutely good question and something we do think about. Yeah. All right, we're out of time, so let's thank Hillary.